So I'm delighted to introduce today's guest in our MOOC for the field trip. This is Professor John Cromaldi from the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Colorado, who does a lot of interesting work, and the work he's going to talk to us about today has to do with um, chaotic mixing and marine invertebrates. All right. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Liz, and um, nice to share some of our research with this. Um, I'm not going to actually talk a lot about math today, um, but I'm going to try and focus on telling you about a problem that makes use of a lot of the uh, products that come out of nonlinear the field of nonlinear dynamics and dynamical systems. So, what one of the things that we're interested in, in our research group is reproduction, so the sexual reproduction of corals. And so, as you've all heard, obviously, coral reefs are, are disappearing everywhere in the world. Um, so, what we're looking at here on, on this slide is a, a beautiful photograph of a coral that is in the process of spawning. So, corals are animals and they're gendered. So, um, there are male corals and, and female corals, and they reproduce sexually. And they do this in a synchronized fashion where the males extrude sperm into the flow and the females, and you're seeing a female coral here, extrude eggs into the flow and they do this roughly at the same time. But the problem is that they're separated at a distance and so if they are extruding egg and sperm in a very, very simplified perspective of this flow, if we look at the time average concentration distributions downstream, which I've color coded here for the eggs in blue and the sperm in red, we would expect to see some Gaussian plume dynamics downstream and where these blue concentrations of egg and red concentrations of sperm start to overlap, we, we can produce fertilization. And you'll start seeing these purple hues correspond to locations where we have co-occurring concentrations of egg and sperm. The problem here is, is that by the time these things do start co-occurring in the same places, you can see that the concentrations are actually greatly reduced down here. So if we actually compute a fertilization rate, typically the fertilization rate will be proportional to the product of the co-occurring local egg and sperm concentration. So basically this lower image here in grayscale is just what happens if we multiply through this blue concentration field by this red concentration field. And so you can see that this region here turns out to be this region in the fertilization field. The problem is, is if you look at a fertilization rate that you would predict from this type of time average approach, you end up getting a fertilization rate that is vastly smaller than the fertilization rate required to sustain the species. Mm -hmm. And the species have sustained themselves for millennia up until you know humans got involved in the picture. <laughs> and so obviously there's something wrong with this model. Mm -hmm. This is how we got involved with this. We got interested in trying to understand what might be missing from the simplified view. And that's where sort of the dynamical systems approach comes in. So what I want to do is I want to zoom in to a little box here at some downstream location and show you some uh, laboratory data that shows what an instantaneous as opposed to time average viewpoint of egg and sperm filaments in that little box would look like. And you're going to start seeing something that looks like this. And this is just one snapshot in time where now these very thin blue filaments are filaments of egg and these red filaments are filaments of sperm. And if you took many, many images over time and time averaged them, you'd get back to what you saw in that previous picture. But the point is, if you think in terms of the, the fertilization dynamics where I said that they depend on the product of local concentrations of egg and sperm, if you have some place here where you have a red filament and a blue filament that are overlapping, you get a very nonlinear system because you're taking a large sperm concentration, multiplying it locally by a large egg concentration, and you get a very nonlinearly large fertilization mm -hmm. rate. But the short answer is that it turns out that you get a tremendous amount of fertilization, more fertilization when you consider the instantaneous physics as opposed to what you get in that time average plume model. Um, from a mathematical perspective, you can incorporate these instantaneous physics by doing what's called a Reynolds decomposition. So if we go back to our rate equation where we say the fertilization rate is proportional, and this is just some constant of proportionality, don't worry about that for now, but that's proportional to the co-occurring product of concentration of egg and concentration of sperm. If we take each one of these 
concentration, so let's start with the egg concentration, and decompose it into the sum of the mean concentration, and by mean I mean time average concentration, and then what's left over are then these fluctuating components. And we can do that decomposition for the sperm as well, and then take these decomposed forms of the concentrations and substitute them back into this rate equation, and then time average on that. You end up getting four terms, because it would be two terms times two terms, which is a quadratic, but in the time average, only two of those terms are non-zero. And what you're, what you're left with is two, two terms. This thing is what I was showing you on that previous slide where we looked at the, the product of that time average red plume and that time average blue plume. But you have the second term, which is actually the correlation between the fluctuating quantities. So this turns out to be the thing that we're really interested in and where the nonlinear dynamics really comes into play. I'm going to show you some, some work we've done experimentally in the laboratory. This is a, a large flow facility that we have in my laboratory. It's oh, about maybe seven feet tall and 50 feet long. Um, weighs tens of thousands of pounds when it's full of water. And fun, uh, you can swim in it. I've had students swim in it. Uh, it's like a, a, a continuous pool when the flow is going. And we use some laser-based measurement techniques. I won't go through the details of this, but we have a couple lasers that form a light sheet. And then when the surrogates pass through that light sheet, they form, uh, they fluoresce light, which can be imaged by these cameras and turned into actual numerical data. So here's a picture of, of this system in use, and these are the cameras which are taking pictures of this fluorescence. This is a very simple system that we set up to test the system where we have a cylinder that goes across the flume and then the flow is going this way. And we did this as a, as a simplified case to start with because this is something that's well known in the literature and probably something you've even seen. And when we take these data and process them, we get something that looks like this. The colors are different because this is false color and so forth, but we get some, the point is we get very, very nice data out of this system. And the thing I want to sort of draw your attention to is that if this was the filament of, say, sperm, and this was, say, of egg, they started off at some, at some fairly large distance from one another, separated. But what happens is in this, in this dynamical system, there are these locations, like along here, where these filaments of red and blue are brought very, very close together and eventually start to overlap, such that now if you go back to that fertilization rate equation and think about multiplying through of these mm -hmm. concentrations, you're getting these, these regions of hyper-fertilization in a very nonlinear way. So this is a very simplified thing, and in fact, we can do these types of things numerically, and we do. And so on, on what I'm showing here on the left are a number of different initial conditions for for sperm and egg going past the cylinder, and then on the right are the resulting fertilization rates. But the advantage of being able to do things in the laboratory is that we can look at systems that are much more complex and that are very hard to simulate even today. Um, so this is now an animation of what this system looks like if we release egg and sperm or this red and blue filaments at some separate, some, some distance from one another upstream, but now as they're transported downstream by the turbulent flow, you'll see they're stretched in these fil thin filaments and you start seeing lots of places where they start to overlap. And what we've been able to show conclusively is that you get significantly higher fertilization rates cognizant of the instantaneous flow field, mm -hmm. even relative to what the time average egg and sperm concentration fields would look like in a turbulent flow field. Mm -hmm. So it isn't necessarily the turbulence per se, but it's the instantaneous structure in right. the turbulence that's important. So that's that's a, a real significant finding that, that we have found. And again, this is a an idea of being able to use a dynamical systems approach to try and look at a biological problem. So the message so far is that the instantaneous flow structure locally aggregates these scalars or gametes mm -hmm. that initially started far mm -hmm. apart because the adults were far apart, but it actually causes the selective aggregation and that results in significant fertilization enhancement. And that all happens out here in this correlation term. Mm -hmm. So the second part of our research is really trying to understand though, okay, sure, we can measure that this happens and we can measure this fertilization enhancement, but we'd like to understand why that happens. And so to do that, we've been using something called Lagrangian coherent structures. Lagrangian coherent structures are something that come directly out of the field of, of dynamical systems and, and nonlinear dynamics. And they are a way to, to mathematically understand the coherent structures that exist in a flow field, things like eddies, which I know you've talked about, and vortices. But more importantly, you can find regions in the flow which serve as attractors, meaning that if the red and the blue started off at some initially distant location, they would be likely to coalesce on these 
things called LCS lines. So what I'm showing you here, and I, this is actually um, an animation, uh, student Kenny Pratt of mine has looked at a, a pseudo 2D turbulent flow field and calculated these Lagrangian st coherent structures, and these green lines should be predictors for where fertilization should take place. So if I take the same flow field and now I'm going to put a blob of egg and sperm in the same flow field I just showed you, and I now turn that flow field on, first thing you'll see is kind of what you expect, which is these red and blue things are going to be stretched out into filaments. But remember, they don't know anything about each other. They're completely passive. But something really interesting and almost magical starts to happen is you start seeing this coalescence of red and blue filaments locally to now start forming these very localized purple filaments, which is where fertilization is taking place. And if I take this movie now and I superimpose these two movies on top of one another, and now what we'll see if we watch where those purple coalescent events take place, you'll see that they line up exactly with these Lagrangian coherent structures. So what this ends up being now is a way for us to have an a priori predictive capability to say where those enhanced fertilization rates take place. And what's interesting about this is that these Lagrangian coherent structure fields are a property only of the flow field. Mm -hmm. And for any set of initial conditions, if I put that red and the blue blob in here and here, or here and here, or here and here. It still mixes up. They will always coalesce on those Lagrangian coherent structures which are invariant for this flow. Uh -huh. Which means that you don't need to know the initial conditions. Wow to know where the reactions or the fertilization is going to take place. And that's a really fascinating concept to me. As long as your initial conditions aren't inside something like the... Uh, the An island. Or, yeah. yeah. So there are, there are special cases and where, where you can actually, the flow field can act to maintain segregation mm -hmm. between these. But those are special cases. The other thing we found is that there are also special cases which work really, really well. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. turns out if you put the initial right conditions... Across the ridge? If you put them on repelling structures. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I want to just sort of summarize a little bit, though, to say that, that we're using concepts from mathematics and physics, and in particular, nonlinear dynamics, to try and understand the functioning of this biological system. And so this biological system has evolved to take advantage of very subtle features of the flow field and very subtle features of the mathematics and the physics that in some sense we as humans are still learning about, but they through millennia have evolved to take advantage of. And so in, in some sense, we're actually learning something about math and physics by studying this biological mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're learning something about the biology from studying, uh, studying this from a physical perspective. I want to just give you a quick intro into another aspect of this problem that we are thinking about, and this goes back to the biology. If I am going to zoom in very tightly now, I'm going to really start thinking about much smaller scales. If I start looking at two adjacent filaments of red and blue, these things might look something like that in a, in a cartoon. And what I now need to start reminding myself is that if I drill down into these things, what these things actually are filaments of egg and sperm. And <laughs> Um, these are very happy sperm. Mm -hmm. The sperm, as I mentioned before, are motile, which means that they swim, and they are chemotactic. And one of the big things that I'm interested in my research is how organisms locate things using a sense of smell. And these eggs release a chemoattractant. For many benthic invertebrates, it's tryptophan. So there is a plume of tryptophan which is coming out from this egg, and that plume gets stirred and strained into a very mm. complex structure, just like mm. we saw egg and, and sperm plumes being stirred into complex structures. But now these plumes are taking place at the micro scale, and now these sperm are tasked with the problem of swimming through these very complex odor plumes at the micro scale to try and locate the eggs. And so it's almost this fractal problem. Yeah, yeah. You have plumes of egg and sperm, but when you look at these individual filaments, there are plumes within those filaments, mm -hmm. and there's this secondary problem. So we have a whole other body of research looking at numerical modeling of how these sperm swim and orient themselves uh, relative to these complex odor plumes at the micro scale to locate these eggs. And, and in fact, we have a whole, and yet another body of research where we're, we're doing this at, um, for a whole range of organisms, looking at how animals locate things using the sense of smell all the way up through dogs and humans. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, I think the, the, the thing I would just say in conclusion is, is 
to realize that there are lots of people that are using these types of studies of dynamical systems to look at a really broad range of things that span just about anything you can find in the world. So. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome.